All right, so so today is the last day. So, so today's the last day, and um, I I'd like to um, discuss a little bit about um, the applications of elliptic curves over finite fields to cryptography. Um, so I need to introduce, in case you haven't seen it before, uh, how exactly you set up a an elliptic curve crypto system. So. Um, here is uh, an example. <coughs> yeah? <coughs> zoom in. <laughs> Auto? All right. Um, is that better? He'll tell me in two minutes. All right. Um, so, <clears throat> Alice? And Bob, chosen for the first letters of, of their names, uh, wish to communicate using E Y squared equals X cubed plus seventy one X squared plus X over F eight thousand one hundred forty seven. Okay, that's a prime field. Um, the point P equals this has Order L equals 2081, which is the largest prime dividing uh, the order of E over this field. Um, okay, and so um, Alice and Bob each choose. A random number. K A is Alice's and um, K B is Bob's. All right, so um, Alice does not tell this number to anyone, not to Bob, not to anyone else. Bob, likewise, they are secret. These are the secret keys. And the goal is using these um, unknown numbers um, to the other party to compute something common that both people know. And this can be done in... Um, simply the multiplicative group, um, but it's better to do it in elliptic curve. So um, they first need to compute something public that they can give to other people. So um, Alice computes um, PA her private key random number which she uses to repeatedly add P to itself um, enough times within the elliptic curve group. That's This is her public key now. She sends this to Bob, publishes it, whatever she wants to do. Bob computes likewise a multiple of P using his secret number. Um, because this is related to sort of 
like if we were doing this multiplicative group, we'd be exponentiating. Um, here we have an additive structure, so we're doing repeated addition. So just as an exponentiation, you have a base. Uh, this is sometimes called a base point. Um, so uh, now, um, using uh, Bob's, so, so 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 this is this ends up being um, this point, and this ends up being this point. You can get those by Sage or Magma, uh, or you can write your own code to do it. Um, using uh, Bob's public key, and her secret key, Alice computes And Bob likewise computes uh, the same thing. He uses Alice's public key. And, uh, and he uses his secret key. and gets the same thing. And so now they have some common information that um, without knowing the other person's secret key, they can compute uh, a, uh, say, a common um, key to use in a symmetric algorithm like AES. Um, or there are uh, protocols that would allow them to send uh, a message directly using the public key set up on the OPTA curve. So um, this is exa an example we call the discrete logarithm problem because, um, I mean, if you look at the analogy with exponentiation on, on the multiplicative group over a finite field, uh, you're, you're trying to solve sort of, you're trying to get an unknown exponent if you're trying, if you're trying to break the encryption. Uh, to break the crypto system. Eve chosen because she's an eavesdropper, uh, is um, she must solve that or that. So both those points are known to, to Eve, uh, but N is not. And we're doing this additively, but if we were doing it multiplicatively, this is analogous. To solving AX equals B with A and B known and X unknown. Well, if we were working over, um, say, the real numbers, this would be trivial. We would just break out our logarithm formula uh, and uh, compute as many decimal places as we needed, and we'd be done. Um, 
And if we were using p-adics, uh, there are, of course, p-adic logarithms. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, why can't you do this sort of thing on with uh, elliptic curves um, over finite fields or with finite fields themselves? I mean, we indeed have... Um, and effectively, you know, because elliptic curves are um, uh, basically ha have have a Lie, Lie group structure, you can look at, um, as, in a sense, a logarithm. And from that perspective, you might approach things with the formal group um, on elliptic curve, which I didn't have time to add to my my notes. But um, in practice, it would seem that. Um, it's not as effective as other methods. Um, so uh, I do want to discuss methods of, uh, of attacking the problem, but let's just complete this and say that um, this is called, um, it's, it's called the uh, discrete log problem. or DLP for short. Um, so the ability to um, for this system to work is reliant on the hardness on solving this kind of problem. Um, and if the problem turns out not to be as hard as we expect, then we need to find a different hard problem. The hardness of RSA is based on the hardness of, of factoring. So in any particular key setup you might want to make, uh, you're basically looking at things that are known not to have, for which no polynomial time algorithm is currently known. Um, this uh, can be, the problem can be approached over uh, FP, uh, j just if we're setting up the discrete logarithm problem on the multiplicative group FP, not on the, the curve, that has um, a sub-exponential algorithm that works against it using sieve methods called uh, index calculus. There are sub-exponential methods of factoring, as we learned, uh, but seemingly the best methods against elliptic curves directly are um, not that uh, not as effective as the methods over over um, FP times. Um, and so for now anyway, it's safer to use elliptic curves from from that perspective. Um, but that doesn't mean it'll stay that way. Um, we need to continue checking uh, the systems uh, and of course with quantum computing looming, um, it's basically already known that um, this can be broken in polynomial time with a quantum computer. So um, it's, um, but in any particular case, however we might want to set it up, we're basically looking for a hard problem to solve. And so let's do a quick comparison about the hardness of the DLP problem uh, in FP times and in um, the, and it overlipped a curve. Hardness of the LP in that or that. So this table comes from NIST 2016, I think is the latest. Um, NIST is an organization which sets standards. Um, some of the standards they have are relatively up to date. Some need revision. Um, but this table is relatively recent. They occasionally make an effort to revise standards. Uh, 
Okay, so there's uh, AES 128-192-256. So that's the symmetric algorithm. Um, in order to get a symmetric key to begin with, you first have to establish communication with public key. So the question is, what public key... Uh, um, and so this is in bits, all right? So this is like the number of bits... Um, and um, so for RSA, you would need 3,072 bits in order to be able to effectively establish a 128-bit uh, key for AES. Likewise with Diffie-Hellman. And seemingly, uh, this is saying that RSA and Diffie-Hellman are at the same level of difficulty because their numbers, the number of bits required for each, are the same. ECDH, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, is much better from this perspective. It is only the double of the number of bits of AES. So it's growing proportionally to the number of bits of AES, whereas the number of bits required by RSA and Diffie-Hellman is growing. And so if you go even higher, the elliptic curve method has an even better benefit. And then SHA, which is a hash algorithm, or SHA-3, is on par with, with uh, um, the curve Diffie-Hellman. Um, so if you look at those numbers, it starts to look like, um, like it's better to, uh, like a, a lot better to send something with the curves than with, with RSA and Diffie-Hellman. Um, that's a little bit misleading because um, the computations for the curves do require more work. And so to really have an apples to apples comparison, you need to sort of break down the algorithm efficiencies of, of each approach. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, I'm not going to prove any of these for you. Um, Okay, so when I say when I quote algorithm efficiencies, I prefer using the logarithm of the size of the number, essentially the number of bits. It's more telling because when you are plotting times from a computer, like if you act, run actual tests on a computer, um, and plot a chart of how it grows when you increase the number of bits, that's exactly what you see is that if it's something's growing quadratically in N, then you see a quadratic growth in N in terms of the time. So from this perspective, then, um, the, when uh, Teitelbaum showed this, uh, the exponentiation was log X, okay, his X was, was the number itself. So his log X is my N, okay, but that's the total, he was talking about the total number of steps and kind of ignoring the asymptotics within each step. And that's an important detail. Uh, if you really want to get the asymptotics correct, you can't ignore the amount of computation done within each step. So here are some examples. So um, addition and subtraction. So the way you you compute these is you basically count. You, each small number operation, and by small number I mean less than 32 bits, um, each small number operation on uh, a computer uh, takes, um, you can imagine taking um, a fixed, a bounded amount of time. 
So if you count the number of small number operations and how that grows with, with n, um, then you get the right asymptotic. So we get O n for addition and subtraction, which is not surprising at all. Uh, multiplication this is somewhat of a lie. I'm going to be uh, n ignoring small factors. Um, a nice one that you might say here is n log n log log n. Um, but we can do better than that. Um, and, and this is with the Fourier transform, using the Fourier transform for multiplication. Extended binary GCD. Um, if I asked you uh, the efficiency of the Euclidean algorithm, um, you would probably say uh, it's linear. Um, but that's the number of steps. Um, and each step, if you're just implementing Euclidean algorithm, is requiring multiplication because you're doing this division process. And so each step is going to have n log n. So you get n times n log n, which is bad. Okay, so that's because that's more than quadratic. And you, we can get something that's less than quadratic. We can get n log log n. So this is with sort of um, um, a, a very tricky uh, approach to, um, it, it involves a binary GCD and involves sort of a, what's called a, uh, um, <coughs> right, so, so you could an algorithm is O n squared log n. And, and this is, it's, it's using a divide and conquer approach to the binary GCD, um, similar to the multiplication approach. Um, okay, and then there's division with Newton's algorithm. get log n squared steps. Each step requires three multiplications. So you get n log n times another log n. Um, exponentiation. So Teitelbaum was saying that you have n steps, but um, each step is taking n log n, so you get n squared log n. And if you're doing uh, modular, if you're doing exponentiation mod prime, it's still that, pretty much. Um, uh, point addition on elliptic curves. without the Koblitz trick and using the um, fast square transform multiplication is the same as ordinary multiplication um, with a different constant. Um, and then there's exponentiation on with the curves, which is the same as ordinary exponentiation with a different constant. So I want to compare those. And the other day, it was asked what Scof's algorithm is, and Scof at least in terms of how I would implement it, is effectively like that. Ignoring some other constants. So, and it, you, can, you can keep going. So, but anyway, the point is, if you do a di direct comparison between, if you do a direct comparison between um, RSA and 
and Diffie-Hellman, and, and, and with the curve Diffie-Hellman, okay, let's say you look at RSA 3072 and ECDH 256, which are the same level of security. Um, this is saying that the N we have to use is 3072 times bigger, or is 12 times bigger than, than the one we use for this. Okay, and if you compare the coefficients of this to this, um, you get 4 to 15. Okay, so the coefficients are 4 to 15, making, I mean, we're, we're doing simpler calculations if we're just doing ordinary exponentiation. Um, I probably shouldn't be comparing to R R RSA. I should probably be comparing to Diffie-Hellman, but you're still doing exponentiation in RSA. Um, but you have 4 to 15 as, as the ratio there. Um, but then because of this ratio, let the curves catch up. You have that, 4 over 15 times 12 squared, which is then equal to 38.4 asymptotically anyway. So this is sort of estimating that you could get an implementation that was roughly 38.4 times faster with elliptic curves than with RSA. Um, not saying you could do that exactly. Uh, it's just a uh, theoretical estimate based on asymptotics. And so all these sorts of things need to be taken into account because we expect our information when we're um, getting uh, things from Amazon to be immediate. Uh, we, we want, um, so, and Amazon servers are, are swamped with this. So they need to be able to do the calculations quickly for however many people are logged in at the same time. Um, so that solves at least part of the problem. The problem at the server end, being able to calculate it quickly. Another part is transmission. You need it to be transmitted quickly. And um, the, the situation is usually, so with RSA, for 3072 RSA, you're sending 3072 bits. For each each exchange, um, for ECDH, we send two uh, two fifty six. We send two fifty six bits per coordinate. And so this is why um, there were many attempts. In, early in the history of elliptic curve cryptography to try and reduce the amount of information sent, um, the so-called point compression algorithms, to attempt to send a, not the entire y-coordinate, but say just part of the y-coordinate or something like this. What Bernstein pointed out is that you can actually skip sending the y-coordinate completely. You can just send the x-coordinate, at least if you're using the Montgomery curves, you can just send the x-coordinate. And the reason for that, I don't know if you saw this in the notes, um, but if you read the section about, um, uh, well, completely anyway, if you read the section about um, the curve uh, geometry, 
uh, I show how on, Mo on Montgomery curves you can exponentiate uh, without the y coordinate. You can basically just use x and z. And, uh, but he's saying not only do we do that, we also avoid even checking the y coordinate, whether we have a valid point on our curve. Um, and as I'll discuss in a minute, um, that relies on both the elliptic curve and its twist being safe. You need both to be safe and not just one. Otherwise, Alice has a strong, uh, Eve has a strong attack. So that is um, important. Why do you need both to be safe? Uh, well, I guess I should list all the safety criteria because then I go into discussion about the. That. So these are the safety criteria. that uh, Bernstein subscribes to and that I subscribe to. Um, choose a large odd prime P and an elliptic curve E over FP satisfying all of the following. The largest prime L dividing the order of the elliptic curve over FP is greater then some bound. Okay, with Sage, you can factor P plus one minus AP, okay? Um, and then that factorization could have more than one, will generally have more than one factor if you want the largest, Sage lists them in order, so you want the last factor. So you can get the last factor by just minus one in brackets. Minus one. Zero gives you the, the zeroth component of the vector, but minus one will give you the, the last component. And then you don't want the exponent, you want just the prime itself. The exponent should be one, ideally. Um, you could check that if you want. Uh, the attack that this is the strongest attack against this that you need the, to set the bound to resist is the Pollard row attack, which I am not going to discuss today. It is in the notes. Two, embedding degree. Um, so there, the way you might want to define this um, for general number theory versus the way you want to define it for um, cryptography are slightly different. Uh, I'm going to define it for cryptography. Uh, the embedding degree, um, so we want it to be greater than some bound. And you calculate it, you can calculate it um, as the multiplicative order of P mod L. And I'll explain where that comes from. Uh, Okay, and the strongest attack that that's supposed to defend against is the mob attack, which I am going to discuss today. I had to pick an attack to discuss. I 
that's that's it because that gets me to talk about the vape pairing. Um, <clears throat> CM uh, discriminant. is greater than some bound. Sage, square free part, four P minus A P squared. Um, you want that to be as big as possible. Attack. Unknown. It's basically, um, Bernstein tries to argue that so small CM discriminant could be um, problematic, but I mean, we don't really have a known attack that makes it that problematic. There's currently no reason to see why small discriminant is any better than large, worse than large discriminant. So this seems unnecessarily, if the CM discriminant isn't really a problem, to unnecessarily rule out Koblitz curves, uh, which may indeed be quite safe, seeing as they satisfy other conditions pretty easily. Um, but, you know, more studies should really be exerted to understanding the CM discriminant. So it's definitely a good thing to draw attention to. And I, I do discuss a little bit my feelings about that in, in the section of the notes. And um, there are two more that I <coughs> list in the notes, two more safety criteria that I'm not going to spend as much time on except to say that... Um, there are ways you can sort of, that an attacker can replace a, a point on the curve you're using by a point not on it, but on some other curve that has weaker security conditions. And if you don't check that that point is on your curve, then you could end up in trouble. So how then can Bernstein say we can get away with not checking the y-coordinate at all? By specifying both that the curve and its twist be safe. So here's the deal. So the NIST curves are not safe if you're not checking that the point's on there for the following reason. So the NIST curves are like this. Y squared equals X cubed minus 3X plus B. The amazing thing, and probably the thing that led them to be chosen in the first place, is that the addition law does not depend on B. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> that would seem to be a great thing. Um, it makes implementation simpler. It makes the algorithms faster. Um, why wouldn't you want that? Well, if an attacker tampers with B and replaces B with some curve with points of small order and then sends these imposter points to you and you're not checking carefully, um, you could end up revealing your number uh, mod a bunch of small primes uh, and then the attacker can weave them together with the Chinese remainder theorem, much like Scope's algorithm, and get your number. And that's basically a polynomial time attack. Uh, so you, if you use the NIST curves, you need to check the y core. You need to check that the points is on your curve. Absolutely, there's no way around it. Um, and so that's the so what you the example. Uh, do I have the example number listed here? Did, so I have an example. It's the first, basically the first example I go over in the section. Well, second example. First example is the Diffie-Elman setup. First example of an attack. Um, okay, so that's why if you... It either adds a lot more time, a lot more checking that needs to be done to make sure it's safe, or if you want to avoid the checking, uh, 
you need to use a different curve. So the advantage of Montgomery curves by squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus x. The addition law depends on a, but not on b. So an attacker could send an imposter point from the twist but if the twist is also safe, that's not, they're not going to get very far. Um, whereas this, uh, there are effectively uh, a much larger number of options for B. We're still working mod P, so there's a finite number of them. But it, it's likely that quite a few of them will have points of small order. So there's, there's effectively only two options for Montgomery curves, just by changing B to something that has is a quadratic non-residue. Whereas here, there's effectively P choices. Well, not quite P. There's going to be some exceptions based on the discriminant. But, you know, nearly proportional to, to P. A lot more. And um, so that th that's a very critical thing. So when you're checking safety of of Montgomery curves, you're really checking for both uh, for, for fixed A and for both B, where B is 1 and some uh, non-residue, uh, non not quad quadratic non-residue. So that is the reason why you need to check both. Um, and I, it's the first example you can see there. But now, with the remaining time, I want to discuss the mob attack and the day pairing. So, the mob attack is named after the people who came up with it. It uses the they pairing to which we will define right now. They pairing is a bilinear pairing. Um, well, it's defined for more than just um, L, but we're, we're using it for L. Um, from really the elliptic curve since dual, but the elliptic curve is self-dual. So two copies of the elliptic curve to the, um, the L roots of, of unity. Um, it's defined on L torsion as I have it here. Um, you can compute it using Miller's algorithm. C example 17. Um, and for elliptic curve defined over FQ, we need two properties. to um, hold <coughs> A, full torsion, full L torsion, B, we need mu L to inject into multiplicative group 
of some extension of FQ for K as small as possible, which then by um, basic group order means we need L to divide Q to the K minus 1, i.e. Q to the K is congruent to 1 mod L. And so that's why K has to be the, the order of Q mod L. Um, and I am glossing over a little bit here. I mean, technically, to get full L torsion, um, as you saw in the last lecture that I did, you might need to actually take a quadratic extension. Um, this may be enough to get uh, the L torsion polynomials to split, but if they don't have roots, if, if the Y coordinates, if they aren't squares, if the roots aren't squares, then, well, if, if you plug them into the, polynomial, into the polynomial and you get, you, you might not get points on the curve. So um, you, this is kind of a lower bound in that sense. Um, for th from a theoretical point of view, you might want to define the embedding degree as the least degree extension over which the very pairing is defined. This could be less than that. But if we're trying to be safe, it's okay if we have um, aim for something less than the degree, the actual embedding degree. If that's as big as possible, then the actual embedding degree is going to be even bigger. Uh, so that's not a really big problem. And so the strategy is you set, you set up the, the Vey pairing on, on the curve, uh, and then you, tra you transfer the problem to, uh, to the multiplicative group. And you can solve in the multiplicative group, solve DLP in... FQ K times with index calculus, which is uh, sub exponential and faster than anything that w would work natively on the with the curve as it is currently known. Um, so I want to do quickly um, an example of. I'm not going to do the whole construction of the Vey pairing the way I, I alluded to with Miller's algorithm. You can look at example 17. But I want to, with the, just a few minutes here remaining, um, explain how you can use SAGE to compute the Vey pairing. So example with SAGE. Uh, while Alice and Bob are usually successful in their security attempts, Carol and David tend to be people that I pick to be victims of. So um, here we have David. Um, David is using this super singular curve. over F43. You can check it has embedding degree 2. Right, that's pretty bad for, for David. Uh, P equals 1324 is a base point. With order L equals 11. Right, so you can see L does, uh, 11 does not divide 42, right? <laughs> but 11 does divide uh, 43 squared minus 1, which is 42 times 44. 11 divides 44, so, so that shows that it has embedding degree 2. David's uh, key, so his public key, his private key is 
six. Compute six e equals four five. Okay, so now Eve does not know six yet. Eve knows um, four five. That's PD, and she knows thirteen twenty four. And she wants to extend to full 11 torsion. So, so I did this calculation by hand, but as I say, you, you, well, I wrote it on this previous page, so I'm not going to write it up again. You, you can do it mod, mod P, P uh, comma L dot multiplicative order parentheses. So that gives you two, um, and so then she says, okay, well, then I need the extension of uh, the quadratic extension of F43. So she goes to K dot A equals G F 43 square. And if you want to know, uh, I mean, you could ask for the polynomial that's being used here, but you can also just... You know it's degree two, right? So you square A, and it's going to output the result for A plus nine using the power basis in, in A. And so then that tells you that X squared minus four X plus nine is the polynomial in question, just by computing A squared. Um, so then she defines the elliptic curve E over K this is all sage stuff K comma zero 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 one zero uh, and you can check if you want that it has order divisible by 11 squared that it's a billion group um, actually it's not something of the squared order, but you actually have full torsion. You can do E dot uh, abelian group if you want. Let's check that. Um, you can do E dot division polynomial. And Eve actually needs points to work with. So she computes the division polynomial. It splits. She needs the first, since she does not have full 11 torsion over F43, she needs the first factor which, with a root in the extension, but not in the base field. So that factor, at least on Sage, is this. If you do it on magma, you might get a different factor. I don't know. But um, that's giving you the x coordinate. Um, so then you can determine uh, the y coordinate um, by doing e dot uh, defining polynomial. which gives you, say, x cubed plus x minus y squared. Uh, well, it includes z, actually. It gives you the homogeneous polynomial. And so you plug in with minus 2a plus 4, and z equals 1. And you're left with a quadratic in y, which you then factor. And it gives you 